Bibles, open to the book of Acts this morning. If you would, Acts chapter 1. Thank you for being here, joining us live. If you join us online as well, then welcome to you this morning. It is a wonderful morning out there, a little bit nippy out there, and a little bit of snow coming. Uh, but you can rest assured, barring a power issue, we, and even then, we will have church here at First Baptist Church. So you don't have to call, you don't have to look at Facebook. Is First Baptist Church going to be open on a Sunday morning? We'll be here. If I can't make it in one of my vehicles, all right, then I have some people who will be happy to pick me up in their four-wheel drive vehicles. If they can't make it, uh, then we'll figure out a snowmobile method to get here. We'll have church with those who can be here. And I'm glad you're here. And those who join us online, a special welcome to you as well this morning. And I'm excited because today we will begin the next series on a Sunday morning, and that's going through the book of Acts. And our theme for this year is proclaiming Christ or proclaiming Jesus Christ. If you remember, as I mentioned last week, proclaiming Christ is not merely talking about him with our speech, though that is one avenue of proclaiming Christ. And we ought to be talking about Jesus Christ with our speech. We ought to be mentioning him. We ought to be making him famous. We ought to be witnessing to those around us. But that in this passage we'll find, and in throughout the book of Acts, that talking about Jesus is merely one aspect of proclaiming Christ. Amen. You see, proclaiming Christ is not just talking about him. It is a life that lives to exalt him and lives to magnify him and uses their resources and stewardship to promote Jesus Christ who seeks to see others touched by Jesus Christ, their co-workers, their family members, their friends, their neighbors, strangers that they may meet only one time. One who wants to proclaim Jesus Christ is one who is about the kingdom of God and is about the Lord's business. It's about our witnessing and about our soul winning. Proclaiming Christ is about our love and how we love one another and those who are around us who aren't Christians. Proclaiming Christ is about our choices day in and day out. Proclaiming Christ is about a church. Proclaiming Christ is about our money, about our family. It's about our life's goals and dreams and endeavors. Proclaiming Christ is about our work ethic, our integrity and character. Proclaiming Christ involves our rights given to us by the government where we live. Proclaiming Christ is about our service. Proclaiming Christ is about missions. And all of those things I just mentioned are found in the book of Acts. I don't know of a better book that would more aptly describe Christians who are about the business of proclaiming Christ. And this morning I'm excited to introduce this particular series in Acts chapter 1 this morning. The book of Acts, some have called a church history textbook. It details in great detail what happened in the early church. It's foundational, full of miracles, full of power from the Holy Spirit, full of excited and passionate believers. It's full of a pagan society that desperately tried to snuff out Christianity at every turn. The book of Acts is not necessarily a church manual. That makes sense? It doesn't mean that just because they did it at, in, in the, uh, the city in Jerusalem that that's how our church ought to operate. Some things in Acts are merely to tell us how they operated, and then we find further instruction later on. But the book of Acts will encourage us, it will challenge us, it will strengthen us, and it will send us on this mission of proclaiming Jesus Christ. How are you at proclaiming Jesus Christ? How are you with your speech at proclaiming Jesus Christ? Do you ever talk about him? Do you ever mention him to those who are saved and those who are unsaved? Does he come up in your speech with your coworkers? Do your neighbors know that you're a Christian or just do they know that every Sunday morning you drive off and a little while later you come home? How are you proclaiming Christ? If we were to display your bank account information on the screen, not only would your identity be stolen by the good people of First Baptist Church, but would we discover that your bank account would show us that you're one who with your bank account proclaims Jesus Christ? 
Would we see transactions that would further the kingdom of God? Or would we merely see transactions that would further your own agenda and your own wants, needs, desires, and your supposed necessities? What if we were to place your calendar up on the screens behind me and we saw how you filled your days and your evenings? Would we see descriptions of someone who is about the Father's business taking care of their responsibilities because even in the garden, God gave responsibilities and jobs. And in our job, we're about the Father's business. But what do we see a life that is proclaiming Christ through your calendar obligations? What if we saw your love? What if we saw your love toward each other? Would we see love displayed that is proclaiming Jesus Christ? Or would we see love that is self-serving? that is temperamental, that is only as good as how you felt that day. How are you, how am I, at proclaiming Jesus Christ? This morning, we'll look at our text and we'll get there eventually, but I want us to read uh, verses 8 through 12. I believe this particular passage of Scripture will set the foundation for the entire book of Acts and also... Give us a snippet of a view into something that falls on every single Christian that will cause us all to trip up. So if you would, please, Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse number 8, where Jesus speaks these words, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem... And in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then return they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. If you would, let us go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, as we approach your word, we approach it with a holy reverence. Lord, I ask that today, as we investigate this portion of Scripture, you would challenge us. Your spirit would touch us. And Lord, if there's a behavior, if there's a motivation, if there's an action that does not line up with your truth and with your will for us, that we would be convicted, Lord, that we would, by grace, repent and come back to you. Lord, the scripture is not just to inform us. But Lord, it's here to transform us. So Lord, I pray that today we would be transformed to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. If there's someone here who doesn't know you as Savior, has never trusted in Jesus Christ, I ask that today that they would look to you. Lord, we love you. We'll give you the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. We find in Acts chapter 1 kind of the, the, uh, the set, setting the stage for the rest of the book. Throughout the book, we're going to just discover some amazing things, and perhaps you've been reading Acts along with us in the church reading, and if you've not had a chance to grab one of those rooted books in the back, then please grab one and begin the book of Acts. I encourage you as a congregation to read the book of Acts with us this month, and we will complete the book before we complete the sermon series, just so you know. But you will find as you read in the book of Acts that there are some just outlandish, amazing things that God did. You know that God still does amazing outlandish things. Every time someone comes to know Jesus Christ as Savior, that is amazing. That is outlandish. No, 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 work with me here. That is outlandish to think that the God of the universe, the eternal one, would send his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for a filthy, rotten, pagan sinner. But he did. And that by simply trusting in him, we don't have to work our way to heaven. We don't have to embark on some journey and, and crawl on our knees to find eternal life. We can simply place our faith, ask him for forgiveness of sins, and he grants it. That is outlandish. 
but it's true. And we find in the book of Acts these things happening over and over again, the power of God clearly on display. You know that, that the God of Acts is still the God of 2024? My Christian, we forget that. We see the election results, and we're like, oh, the world's coming to an end. The same God who saved 5,000, 3,000 in a day is the same God that we serve. The same God. In fact, the same God that bound the mouths of the lions for Daniel is the same God you and I serve. And we see the news and we get discouraged. We see our bills versus our bank account balance and we get discouraged. We see the report from the doctor and we get discouraged, disheartened. God is at work and God wants to work. This book begins in verses 1 and 2. You notice that, that uh, Luke is going to be the author of this book. He's going to talk about how this is the, the second treatise, and he's referencing the fact that he also wrote the book of Luke. He'll explain in the first few verses, uh, and actually verse number three, how that Jesus Christ is very much alive. Now this concept, this infallible truth is foundational for our life. Jesus Christ is not dead. He is alive. And Luke was reminding those who would read this book, you and I included, that Jesus Christ was very much alive. And he says in verse number three that he showed himself with very many infallible proofs. They were not just convincing proofs. They were infallible tr tr truths and proofs. I want us to notice something that happens here because as Luke, as Luke begins the book of Acts, we come to the end of Jesus Christ's earthly ministry. A little touch over 30 years did Jesus Christ live and then ministered for a few years, died on the cross, and then for 40 days after the resurrection appeared to the believers. He appeared countless times proving himself that he was who he says he was. And that he did what he said he would do. He ate food to demonstrate that he could still do that. And he walked through walls to demonstrate he could do that. He appeared and disappeared at will. He waited in the conversations and he, he made statements that caused the understanding to be enlightened to demonstrate his power. And now he is literally at the end of his earthly ministry. He is done right here. In just a few moments, as the scripture tells us, he will go from this earth to heaven. Now, we pick up here, please, in verse number four. If you have your Bibles, please, in Acts chapter one, where it says, And being assembled together with them, and commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So understand that Jesus Christ is now giving some final words. He's going to tell them, listen, what's going to take place is supernatural. It is divine in origin, and it is purposeful. But notice verse number 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord... Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now, their question is seemingly from left field. Jesus Christ has now shown himself over the last 40 days through miraculous and infallible proofs that he was dead and now he's alive. And the question they ask is, Lord, are you going to get this world figured out so that Israel is ruling again and in charge of Rome. You with me so far? They have missed the mark. Are you with me right now? They're like, Lord, this is really neat, if I can. This is really cool. You're amazing. So is it time to kick out the Romans or not? The time to right all the wrongs because, you know, we're, we're carrying burdens. We're compelled to one mile and we have to go the two miles. You remember that? Remember how we're not in charge. Pilate's still in charge. So, Lord, now is it time. You're going to knock them all off and here we go. And this is the background for what Jesus' final words will be. Now, Jesus Christ does not slap them upside the head. Why? Why? Because he's full of compassion and mercy. 
And I'm glad he doesn't do that to us when we ask stupid questions. Because we are apt to ask questions that are not to be asked or not in the context of the situation. Now, we always think that ours are important, right? We think that ours are meaningful, that ours deserve to be answered. But so did they. Jesus Christ here brings us now to this refocused. We come to our text this morning. I've entitled the first part of this message, What Jesus Calls Us to Do. What Jesus Calls Us to Do. Let's look at this verse again, if you would, please. Verse number 8. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. As we look at this calling, this is a calling that is not just for those apostles that day. This is a calling for every Christian who would ever read these words of Jesus Christ. This is a calling for you and for me. We cannot set this calling aside and say, well, this is just for Peter. This was just for James. This was just for John. Because the apostle Paul becomes later on in the story. And guess what he did? The same thing. The Christians that were saved throughout this time, guess what they were called to do? The same thing. And guess what you and I are called to do? The same thing proclaim Jesus Christ. Now, I want to paint this in a slightly different look this morning. If you'd humor me for a few moments, would you do that? Now, do you have a choice? You're stuck here at least for, the, for a few more minutes. I want you to imagine for a moment that what Jesus says is not just said to a group of disciples, but is said to a football team. I want you to imagine what he's saying here is literally the greatest coach speech ever given. Now, we are in football season right now. We're going to hit some playoff games. In fact, many of you know the Lions will play at some point today, or at least they'll be on a game that's televised. Whether they play or not is yet to be seen. does not matter. It's merely football. But every coach tries to encourage their squad, tries to give them a reason to play, tries to, tries to bring some passion and some knowledge and some instruction before the big game. Coaches like recently retired Nick Saban, Bear Bryant, Jim Harbaugh, Vince Lombardi, Dan Campbell. They'll all give a speech to their players. And in this context, I want you to think for a moment, the last things that Jesus Christ says on this earth in this context as he looks at these 11 disciples. Remember, there were 12, but Judas was no longer with them. And to, I believe, these 11, he gives them some powerful instructions, some clear instructions some go get them instructions. I've had the privilege of coaching sports for almost, uh, for almost 27 years. The first team I coached, I was in high school. And I coached little kids. And they coached them in soccer. Did they win? Sure. You'll never know. I don't remember. But in my mind, I'm sure they won. I coached boys' soccer for a number of years and enjoyed that very much. And then had a brief stint for about six or seven years where I coached girls' volleyball. I discovered that boys and girls are very different. How they're motivated is very different. How they're driven is very different. How they respond is very different. Boys can have tears. Boys will have tears usually after the game, if it's a loss. Girls can have tears during a game. This is different. Not good or bad, it just is. I've coached young, I've coached old. I've noticed that there's always different responses, and one of the things that I tried to, to learn as I, as, I, as I coach was how to motivate people. You know that people are motivated different ways? Some need the you-can't-do-it speech. 
For whatever reason, that's how they go. And, and you can read them like, oh, you know what? Hey, coach, I'm going out there. Yeah, you can. I'm not sure you're going to do it. Oh, I can do it. Eh, I'm not sure. In practice, you can do it all week long. I'm not sure you can do it today. That's I'm going to show you, coach. They get out there and they do it. Some need that motivation. Now, look at that. I'm crazy. This, this is true in life, all right? Others, you say that too. They'll demoralize for the rest of their life. You can't do it. You're right, coach. I'm done. I'm quitting. And they take out their uniform and they leave. That, and they leave. All right? Boy, you can do this. You think so? I know so. I know you can. I have confidence in you. Boy, I don't know. I messed up yesterday. But you're not going to mess up today. Okay, coach, I'm in it. I want to listen here. I want to read this verse again, but I want you to listen to how Jesus Christ challenges and motivates us as followers. Look at verse number eight, please. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Did you catch it? How did he motivate us? Number one, he said this, you will be filled with supernatural power. This is the motivation for what you and I can do as, as witnesses of Jesus Christ, as proclaiming Christ. We will be filled with supernatural power. That's all we need. It's not, listen, you're going to have to get up some early mornings. Now we'll have to. You're going to have to work through some times when you're tired, and it's going to be cold out. It'll be hard out there. There's going to be shipwrecks. No, Jesus does not say any of that. He just says, listen, you are going to receive the Holy Ghost. And that's all you need. And my friends, that's all you and I need is Holy Ghost power in our life. Now, throughout this series, not all today, but there's a way we can limit the power of the Holy Ghost in our life. And we wonder why life stinks. We wonder why, we wonder why we're discouraged, why we're disheartened, why we don't see anything, why the miracles are not there, why there's no power there, because we've limited the supernatural power of God. But Jesus said, here's the motivation. You get God. You get God. He's going to come upon you. You see, this sets up the whole stage for the book of Acts. When thousands are saved, it's God. When those are healed, it's God. When the church is established, it's God. When, the, when those who are against Christ, they're befuddled, and, and they're... And they're and they can't find any traction. You know what? It's God. When you find saints willing to lay down their life, God. Amen. My friend, number one, what Jesus calls to do, he fills us with supernatural power. Number two, he tells them this, you have a purpose of the utmost importance. He says, ye shall be witnesses unto me. Do you understand that when we're called to proclaim Christ, we're not called because of a mission of First Baptist Church. You're not called because a group of believers back in the, I believe the 50s or so founded this, this wonderful church. Or because Pastor Let led us on this path for so for 44 years. This mission is a mission of the utmost importance given to us by Jesus Christ, where you and I are called to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. We're not called to be witnesses of your greatest catch while you were out fishing, of your greatest shot while you were out hunting, or your greatest accomplishment while you're out working, or your greatest uh, building while you're out building, or your greatest uh, zinger while you're out sarcasm. All right? We are called to be a witness of Jesus Christ. It's of the utmost importance. In fact, these disciples were eyewitnesses. And you and I, we've experienced the power of God. We've not seen him, but Jesus said that we're more blessed by not having seen and still belief. And we're called to declare, to give witness, to proclaim everywhere we go of Jesus Christ. Through our words, through our finances, through our schedule, through a life. It says, the only reason I'm here is the supernatural power of God. How can you travel that path with grace? The power from the Almighty God. How can you have joy in the midst of tribulation and trials? Supernatural power of God. How can you stand when everyone else is mocking you and ridiculing, ridiculing you? Power of God. You see, we have the supernatural power of God. We 
have a purpose of the utmost importance, and our mission is bigger than we can imagine. He says this, You'll be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The mission is not just your friends. The mission is not just your family. The mission is not just your neighbors or your co-workers, and I'm glad you're hitting those people because that's part of it. The mission is them and the whole entire earth. That's our mission. You're like, but pastor, that's overwhelming. It would be if we didn't have God in us. Remember he led off with the motivation? We have the power of the Holy Ghost. The only way to accomplish his mission is his power. Now stay with me because we're in a good part of the sermon right here. Jesus, if I can, stay with me, has just given the greatest motivational speech to his team ever known. All right? In one sense, he's like, okay, team on three. One, two, three, team. And as soon as he's done, the scripture tells us that he begins to go right into heaven. That's what the Bible says. And then a cloud receives him from their sight. They can no longer see him. Now, in the times that I was coaching girls and boys, young and old, the natural response at the end of a coach's speech is like, one, two, three, team, and then a motivation, let's go. All right, right? Like, get out there and go kick the ball or spike the ball or whatever it may be, throw the ball, whatever it is. Like, I've just finished telling you what to do. Now let's go. So what do you imagine the disciples do after Jesus Christ has just said, listen, you're going to have the power of the Holy Ghost. You're going to be witnesses for me, not only in Jerusalem and Samaria, but everywhere, and then whoo, right into heaven. Wouldn't it make sense? His disciples are like, listen, this is awesome. This is great. Let's go. But that's not what they do. In fact, the speech of Jesus Christ... All right, the challenge and mission from Christ is met with silence. There's crickets sounding. And look what happens, please, in the following verses in verse number 9. And when he was spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, they weren't even talking. They just looked. We're steadfast you there. Has the idea that it was uncomfortably long. They didn't even know what was going on around them. Because all of a sudden, there's two white robed angels in their midst. Two men in white apparel. And they had to get their attention. Now, here's the point of the sermon quickly this morning because here's what happens. You and I have a powerful mission. And we have the power of God on our life if you're a Christian and trust in Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost in you. And we can look at the disciples and think, my goodness, how could they just stare into heaven? But you and I are caught doing the same thing. And what they were doing wasn't bad. It was just not on mission. They weren't looking at what they shouldn't be looking at. All right? they, they weren't distracted on their cell phones of the day. They weren't conniving. They were just not doing what Jesus Christ had literally just said to do. He had just said, you're going to go to Jerusalem and the Holy Ghost come upon you. You'll be witnesses. Like, not like a minute earlier. It was not like, boy, what did he say three years ago? I can't remember, Peter. James, you remember? No. It was just then. And just like that, they're off mission. I wish I never got off mission. I wish I was never caught gazing steadfastly into the heavens. I wish. But what these two men say to the disciples, I think it helps us today. 
Because these men, first of all, get, get the disciples' attention. <clears throat> Peter, <clears throat> oh, what? I was looking, Jesus, oh, did you see that? And he was just, wow. Hmm. Hmm. And how many Christians are caught off mission? Not doing a bad thing, but not doing the mission. Look at what these men say to them to challenge us briefly and quickly this morning. First of all, they say this in verse 11, ye men of Galilee. He first of all reminds them of who they were. No doubt, bringing them back to when Jesus Christ called them by the Sea of Galilee. Galilee at times was known as a place of rebellion. Others had said this about this. Scholars have said that Galilee was often known as a place of outsiders, those who didn't fit anywhere else. And he did not call them ye disciples of Jesus Christ, ye apostles, ye followers, and ye men of Galilee. I believe that is there to remind them of God's calling on their life. My friend, let me, if I can, remind you of who you are. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and spirit. You know how to get back on mission? Number one, we remember who we are. I'm an ambassador of Jesus Christ. It is not my life, it is his life. It is not my hands, these are not my hands, they are his hands. And every time that I gaze steadfastly on something else, I am putting myself as the owner, and I'm not my own. Maybe today it's time for you to remember who you are. Remember what Jesus Christ has done for you, how he has saved you, how he wants to sanctify you, how he gave his life for you so that you would live for him, not just look steadfastly on what has caught your attention. Your attention may be caught on something that is seemingly good. It may be a job that God has brought across your way. It's not a bad thing. It's a responsibility. But it's not your main mission. It may be your family, which God has blessed you with. And that, but it's not your main mission. Maybe your eyes get caught over here, and it's time for you to remember who you are. Not only did he remind them of who they were, number two, he refocused them on the mission. Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Brother Ash preached on questions that are asked in the Bible on New Year's Eve. I preached on a question that morning on, on the New Year's Eve as well. These are questions in the Bible that don't require answers. When these men asked the disciples this question, why do you stand here gazing? He was not looking for an answer. But he was trying to prompt for a response. The response is, stop. Stop. Like, stop looking up there. Stop focusing over here because it's time to refocus on the task at hand, on the mission at hand. And so maybe perhaps today the Lord Jesus Christ in your life needs to ask the question, why are you gazing so much at your job? Why are you gazing at your retirement? Why are you gazing at your abilities? Why are you gazing at your logic? Why are you gazing at your kids? Why are you gazing at your house? Why are you gazing at your needs? Why are you gazing at your trials? Why are you caught off guard? Doesn't need an answer. Needs a response. Not only do these two men remind them of who they were, and refocus them on the mission. But they give them a reassurance in their heart. They say, this same Jesus, verse 11, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. I love verse 11 because it's so helpful to you and I as humans. We are fickle. We are short-sighted easily distracted and quickly discouraged. Quickly discouraged. 
Blessings of life seem to leave as quickly as the next problem happens. And here's what these men say, these angels say. Listen, not only are you men of Galilee, remember your calling. Why are you standing here gazing? Let me refocus your mission. But remember this. You can rest assured that the Jesus Christ that you saw go up, he's going to come back again like that. So don't be discouraged as you go back on mission. Jesus Christ is going to do exactly what he said he will do. And his power will not wane. It will not be weak. And so what you see, it's going to invigorate. And they give a, just a reassurance in their heart. And then in verse number 12, disciples have the only right response. The Bible doesn't tell us that they argued or that they delayed. But verse number 12 tells us that they re-engaged in their purpose. They returned unto Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. You see, the disciples that day did what we ought to do today, and that is re-engage. They didn't have a pity party, wallow in self-misery. Oh, man, we blew it. Can you believe it? We blew it. They just put their feet in motion and went back to where Jesus said to go, Jerusalem, and began to wait. And it so set the foundation for everything else to happen. You see, I wish we never got off point. I wish we never strayed and got caught gazing at something that we shouldn't be looking steadfastly at. I wish we never wasted an afternoon. I wish we'd never forgotten our calling as an ambassador of Jesus Christ. I wish we never got down or discouraged. But I'm so glad that at that moment that we realized that we're off mission, that we've just heard the greatest calling, and instead of running toward the game, we've sat there, that all we have to do is get back in the game. You see, it doesn't really work that way in sports. If I, as a coach, give that great speech and the team just sits there, you know, and just sits there and gazes up into the sky steadfastly at some whatever, right, what am I going to do? All right, I have another speech from the coach, right? Now they're going, right? Here, Jesus Christ shows his compassion, mercy, and forgiveness. He says, listen here. I'm sending over here some other help for you, man. These two men are clothed in white apparel. Just to remind you and refocus you so you re-engage. And they do. And nothing, nothing was withheld from them. Jesus Christ didn't say, well, because you are gazing there, you have to wait longer for the Holy Spirit. Well, you would have had all the Holy Spirit, but you only get part of them now. Boy, way to blow it. No. So this morning, my challenge for us, for this church... For myself, you may have missed it yesterday, but get back in it today. You may have missed it last week, but get back in it this week. You may have missed it last month, get back in it this month. You may have missed it last year, get back in it this year. You may have missed it the last 25 years, get back in it for the next 25 years. You see, we have a great purpose. Sometimes, we're just looking over there. By God's grace, remember who you are. Refocus on the mission of proclaiming Jesus Christ and re-engage.